I uh, I had to hit. Re- I I made sure that I hit record before Dan could stop. He was giving me a kudos about how good of an interviewer I am. Because I'm like, the last time I had John, I was a little like polished. But Dan, welcome to the Protectors Podcast. We're in season four, and we are o- almost at 300 episodes so far altogether. Wow! And I can't remember Perfect. when you came on. It was like season two. I'm glad to have you back on. Oh, it's an honor. Always, it's so much fun. You're gonna have to shut me down because I just enjoy talking with you so much. So uh, I'm glad. You have to uh, for me to hook at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. One thing you I have to tell the audience out there, whoever's listening, is Dan has this awesome like photo behind him from the Call of Duty Endowment. And it's from Terminal Lance from Max Irate. It's really cool. I love it. Max is fantastic. Uh, we worked with him on this a couple of years ago, uh, and we decided the time to bring it out again. Uh, it was a theme we sold on PlayStation to raise money for the endowment. Uh, and Max is such a great guy who is such a play uh, on top of being a terrific vet and a super talented artist. He's a very, very nice guy. Yeah, he is. I, I really enjoyed having him on the show. I got to get him back on too, because he right. came up, he had a, he had a really good book came out last year or a year before. I don't even know. White donkey. Yep. Yeah. White donkey. Good stuff, man. But let's talk about Dan, Dan, the Call of duty endowment. A lot of, you know, I've, I've been a gamer for years. I mean, pre-war post-war, all, all the time. I was telling you before that I'm, I'm, you know, I couldn't wait for this new season to start because I'm like, come on, I'm already max. I'm prestige three. I can't get the four. I'm kind of just building up all these points. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make my weapons gold. I'm like, okay, I did that for a little while. Then I'm like, well, maybe I'll, I'll max out all my characters. I started doing all that. And I was I'm like, I know all about the Call of Duty endowment, but all the gamer friends I have and stuff, I'm like, hey, you know, you got to get these skins. You got to get this. You got to get these packs to help out. So what is a Call of Duty endowment for people who don't know, but are gamers? Yeah, so we are, uh, we didn't intend to be this, but we are the largest private funder of veteran employment in the US and the UK now. Um, Through our efforts, we've uh, funded the placement at this point of more than 90,000 vets and jobs. Our goal is 100,000 by 2024. And our model is um, we look for the highest performing nonprofits in the US and the UK to place vets and jobs and we find them we partner with Deloitte to find the most efficient and effective organizations. Like we were talking before, like an example of that is Hire Heroes USA, who you've worked with too. They're amazing. They're one of our 12 grantees and one of the biggest ones. Um, and we, we, beyond funding them, we mentor them, we coach them, we find out what other assets they may need to be successful. And we try to help them grow and, and help more vets. Um, through these efforts, through this evaluation process, We've been able to place veterans in the jobs. The latest number, Jason, is at one ninth the cost of the federal government. And why does cost matter so much to us? Because the, 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 the lower cost, the more vets we can help. That's why we care the most about it. But, but more importantly is the quality of the placements. So um, we'll have our 2021 20, numbers in, a, in, a never, in another month or two, but um, it's been a good year. So our average starting salary has been about 64,000 of the vets we've placed. Um, the uh, six month retention rates around 88% and 94% of the jobs are for full-time work, which is super important. So it's not just a job, we're focused on high quality jobs. Well, you know, I'm glad you, there's a couple of figures that you put out there. One was the cost of the government and two was the, the retention rate because you can get a job and you can be in there for, you know, three months and go, man, this sucks. They got me a job, but it sucks. And you move on and you're, you're back to where you are. And then your stats are kind of invalidated. But when yeah. you're talking 80, 88%, is that what you said? No. Wow, 88% is huge, especially in this market right now. Good for the, the other- employer, good for the vet. You know, it, it's all about the quality. And one of the shocking numbers, we were the first organization to point this out about five years ago. But we, we, we were hearing from a lot of our grantees, like Hire Heroes, Vet Jobs, uh, Still Serving Veterans, that, you know, they, they, they were having a lot of veterans coming to them who had jobs. The problem was they couldn't pay the rent or they could barely get by, or they didn't have benefits, or they couldn't get enough hours. And it's not enough to ask someone if you have a job, it's, you, you have to talk about quality. And so we wanted, we heard these anecdotal stories, and we wanted to, you know, put some numbers behind it. So we, we looked at half a million veteran resumes, and compared them to non veteran resumes with um, com- comparable experience. 
And what we found at the time, again, this is four or five years ago, was that veterans were 16% more likely than non-veterans to be underemployed. So that means you know, not getting jobs that recognize and pay them for their skill set and experience of comparable civilians. So since then, that problem has gotten a lot worse, actually, which is really sad to see. Um, the latest data from the, uh, the Veterans Metrics Initiative out of Penn State, amazing data set they have, by the way, that they update typically every six months to a year, um, shows that 60%, 60% of veterans are underemployed now, um, which is terrible. Um, so, you know, like it, again, it's not just about a job, it's about a high quality job. And that's good for the company and it's good for the vet. Well, I tell you what right now is that I've been volunteering with Hire Heroes USA for years because I, I have a particular set of skills. It's called human resources and stuff like that. You know, granted, I was infantry and all this other good stuff, but I know human resources like the back of my hand. But one thing I've learned is veterans, a lot of times, and this is why the endowment is so important, is when the, I do a resume review or I mentor a veteran, they completely do not put all of their skills down. You can have a combat veteran who led, even E4, led his team, did so many incredible things, but they always have that like progressive responsible experience for four years serving in the U.S. military. I'm like, you did so much more than that. And they, they just discount a lot of their service because they're like, well, I only did four years. I'm like, but you did four years of 365, 24-7, yeah. minus some leave here and there, you know? Yeah, nothing breaks my heart more than when I hear an infantryman say, I'm just a door kicker, right? I'm like, gosh, you are so undervaluing yourself. And, you know, I think the TAP program in general does a disservice to them. Uh, you know, there's so much of a focus in that program on uh, disability claims, you know, and, and it's like, you need to claim this, you need to claim that. And, and, you know, certain folks, they absolutely need to, but it instills this mindset that there's something wrong with you. We just spent four years telling that Marine or that, that soldier, um, how great they were because they were they, they were doing hard stuff for our nation and then we're telling them how broken they are and it's like whoa wait wait a second um, and, and that starts to you know undermine people's confidence as they're going into a really different environment and that's not a good thing um, you know the fact of the matter is the kind of stories you're telling about you know what it what has that ER, e4 done as a team a fire team leader you know where he's been responsible for other soldiers or marines and uh, you know, their training, their weapons, their, um, their welfare, their well-being, and, you know, the sensitive missions and tough places and, and you know, getting the, the mission done with limited resources. These are all things that are valuable to employers. We just need to get folks where they understand that and can really sell themselves, sell, you know, employers on this. And we're, we're not there. That's why we invest in these organizations that are free um, to all veterans and transitioning service members to help them get there to instill that confidence and teach them how to talk about themselves in ways that employers will value them. You know, that four, that eight, that 20 years you've had in the military. Now in the government and outside in the corporate world, you have certain, you know, when you want to get to the executive level, the executive core qualifications, a lot of it's like business acumen, leadership, team building type stuff. You've done that. You've done that, whether that's four years, eight years, 20 years, two years or whatever you've, you've already started that base more than you know a college kid what do they do they study for four years someone gets out of high school they don't do anything they bug around for three or four years you haven't you have an up already and I'm, one of my philosophies has always been like whenever i give speeches or something like that i'm always like hey look your military is bookmarks it's a chapter in your life it's a chapter, and then you're moving on to the next thing. But it's one chapter. It's a good chapter, but it's not your identity. It's not your whole story. Treat this new job like a new mission. And then Absolutely. build your team when you get there and, and enjoy it. And if you don't like it, you go on to your next mission. Absolutely right. Except now you have agency, right? Like now it's in your car, if you want to decide it's time to move on, you move on. That's the nice thing about the private sector. Um, but you know, it's, I think many people, many vets, it's, it's a journey. Uh, you, you know, you do your best. You, you, you shouldn't give up on that first opportunity. You should work really hard to make sure it's a good fit. Um, but, you know, if it's not, that's okay. You can move on to, to another thing. The key thing is kind of learning how to fish, you know, is learning how to talk about your experience. And the thing about it too, is after that first civilian job, now you've got stuff that's instantly translatable to other employers. Um, and then the military stuff is sort of, you know, a nice foundation to build upon. 
Well, one thing too, is when you get that civilian job, you have your resume with all your military stuff, and then you start learning the civilian lingo. So then I always tell people, treat your resume like an infantry fighting position. You're always improving it. You're always improving it. Same thing with your resume, that initial resume you had to beginning and prove upon it. Hire Heroes USA is it's a great organization. And when I when I looked at your website today, I was like, hey, let me, let's see how user friendly this is. I click on it. I put in my demographic. I put in my zip code and it matches me. It tells me it gives me the, the intake form for Hire Heroes USA. And that is incredible. Because uh, I'm like, well, okay, Call of Duty Endowment is this lip service? Are they are they selling packs here and they're just throwing money? No, they're actually doing it. And your figures on the website are sixty three thousand, and now you're up to ninety thousand. That's a lot of bodies. We're we're, you were, we're on track to have a really big year. Last year was our biggest year ever. We had fifteen thousand placements. Um, now we're uh, you know fifteen thousand just in one year, and we're we're looking like we're on track to surpass that this year. So which will be our biggest year ever. Uh, but, you know, the important thing for us to remember is behind every one of those numbers, there's a person. And I love the phrase. I've heard a few people say it. You've met one veteran, you've met one veteran, right? Every, everybody's got a different story. Um, or, you know, we're, uh, and, and that's why these services are so necessary, right? That's why, you look, I, I would say TAP is necessary, but grossly insufficient. Um, you know, 100 soldiers or Marines or sailors or airmen in a room, um, death by PowerPoint for three days does not make you job ready. You're not, you're just not. Um, you need someone to have that personalized conversation with you because, you know, just because you are an infantryman doesn't mean you want to be a security guard just because you get to hold a gun again. You know, that's, um, some civilians think they're doing you a service when they tell you that, but they're not, right? Um, you know, just because you turned a wrench in the Air Force doesn't mean you want to turn a wrench in the civilian world. Um, we, I, I can tell you, I, I, I know a young man who's, uh, uh, turned a wrench on F-15s in the Air Force, and now he's a recruiter in a, in, a, in a company. Never did recruiting in the military, but he just learned he loved working with people and, and ta having conversations. And now he's getting, you know, he's now getting a master's degree at a USC in a, the MBV program. Um, and he's just set the world on fire. He actually wrote or, or led the latest creation of uh, the Veterans Guide to Activision Blizzard, which is awesome, by the way. Um, and uh, Jacob Sato is his name. He's, he's a terrific young man. And, um, you know, he's just because he turned a wrench in the Air Force doesn't mean he couldn't go work in the video game company as a recruiter, right? Um, uh, but it takes work. And these organizations are here to help you get where you really want to be. And they link you up with the right person. So I like to bring up that I work with Higher Heroes USA because I want people to volunteer with them. And when I said that I have a particular set of skills, it's HR. I know the federal government. I know federal law enforcement. So when you check through and you go, okay, I'm a vet on, you go to the call of duty endowment website, you click on, I'm a vet. They link you up with higher heroes USA. You can link up with the right person for the right job. Let's say you don't want to turn a wrench. You don't want to carry a gun. Well, they can link you up with the right volunteer who knows what they're doing, who's there and giving you their time and they'll get you in the right direction. And this also goes out to the people out there who are listening to this, who already have a job, who already have those particular set of skills that also want to volunteer. So there's a lot that goes in behind the scenes at Hire Heroes USA and Call of Duty Endowment to get the volunteers in. And that's where money comes in. And that's one thing I want to talk about these packs. I'm, I, I love Call of Duty. I'm not going to lie. You know, I love reading books. I love my Call of Duty. I like, you know, one thing I like about video games, it's like, you know, it's like you could just sit down for a little while. I could talk smack with my friends. I, I get my, my, my wife calls it the boy band headset on. And I put my little boy band headset on and I'm sitting there and I'm, and now it's not a boy band headset. It's like this big monstrosity. Back in the day, it was like those little headsets. And I sit there and I talk smack with my friends and we hang out. I don't think about the world. I take a little break. I shoot some people. I do some stuff and it's just fun. I, I love it. I, and you know, I, I love it but I like these timeless packs. I like that that Call of Duty is throwing things out there. So maybe people do look into it, do look into the veterans and not just as these damaged veteran war, you know, blah, blah, blah. So let's talk about the packs and how, yeah, yeah let's do that. Yeah, we'll talk about um, our two most recent ones. So every uh, Call of Duty franchise has been an amazing, amazing partner. You know, they're inspired by what actual service members have done and this is how they get back in, they get back in a big way. 
Um, there are many, many ways. Huge shout out to the employees at, at, at the company. Um, so many of them volunteer their time and expertise to make our mission work. We wouldn't work without them. But from a financial standpoint, beyond funding the endowment's operating costs, so every cent we raise, literally every cent we raise goes to putting vets in jobs, these PACs raise funds that you know make our grantees go. And so um, we did two this year, two big ones, actually three, now I think about it, because we did one in Cod Mobile as well, uh, which, which is great. Um, we did uh, the Battle Doc Pack um, in, in May for Military Appreciation Month because we talked about underemployment before, we noticed this crazy thing that in the midst of a pandemic, half of former medics and hospital corpsmen who want to work in the healthcare industry in the civilian world cannot get jobs there, which is staggering, right? Um, because of red tape, because of a whole bunch of other stuff we can talk about if you want. Um, so, you know, from a, from, from a mission standpoint, we, we wanted to fix that. Like that, that is just nuts. What a waste of unbelievable talent. For those of us who've had, myself included, their life saved by a corpsman or a medic, um, you know, we know what these folks have to bear, uh, you know, so we wanted to honor them at a, in the midst of a pandemic and draw attention to this. So we launched the battle doc pack and we worked with a retired, um, army medic distinguished uh, with distinguished service, uh, who's a, also a big call of duty player. Uh, and, but the, that wasn't the main consideration. The main consideration was the service as a medic. Um, and, and, uh, we just, we, we co-designed a pack with him and we launched the battle doc in May and it was great. And, you know, it did two things. It created awareness about the problem and it raised a whole bunch of funds for our mission as well. And then um, with the advent of Vanguard, uh, the newest Call of Duty game, we, we launched the Timeless Pack. Um, and we, what we were trying to get across theme-wise was the timelessness of military service. We did this incredible interview with a World War II combat vet who's in his 90s, he's Canadian. Uh, he was in the Canadian Highlanders in World War II. He lied about his age. Um, he's a youngster at the age of, I think, 95, 94, 95 now. Uh, goes to work every day. Like puts in a full day of work every day still. Um, amazing guy. And we did a, we, we, were, we did a, we partnered with uh, Sledgehammer Games who made Vanguard. And one of their devs, one of their developers, this guy named Ryan, who's an Afghanistan army combat vet, infantryman as well, interviewed him. And it was this amazing moment where like across the generations, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, like the timelessness of serving in the infantry and in combat, it was just, it gave me, it gives me chills now just talking about it. But that inspired us, like there's this timeless na nature of service and combat. And that was the inspiration for the pack. And again, it, it, it's, you know, hey, we're honoring the heroes of World War II in this video game, but that hero, hero those heroics haven't changed, right? And, and the, the bonds formed between infantrymen and combatants haven't changed. So that's what inspired the Timeless Pack. I, uh, I really didn't know if I'd be into another World War II game. I didn't. And I was kind of like, ah, but I couldn't deal with the futuristic stuff, like the jumping around and all that. And there's another game out right now, like Battlefield. I just can't get into it. But <laughs> I, I really, which will not be named. <laughs> yeah, I just, I really enjoy this one. I do. And I, I I shouldn't enjoy it so much because I got things I got books to write. I got podcasts to do uh, and still be a dad on the side. And you can do all these things and still get away and play a little while. One thing that's been great about the Call of Duty is like I've had two guests on so far. I've had Chad Michael Collins, whose character is Alex and getting him to un and him. He's been an actor for years. He's played Sniper and everything. But him getting into the character, he has much more of an appreciation for the military. I guarantee it. And now he knows kind of when he's playing these roles and stuff like that, where he's going. The other one is April Nicole. She's the Rose character skin. And I've had her on a show and she's talking about it. And she didn't know, she knows military people, but now that she's in there, she feels like she needs to respect the character more and stuff. So this is just cross through the actors, influencers. It's not just all veterans that are getting involved with this community. And it's, it's, it's just really interesting. Yeah, it's, it is really interesting. And I think it's important that we draw in non-vets into this community because there are a lot of folks who want to help and can help. And you, you, there, there's a lot of untapped passion there, right? Um, every time we've worked with, um, you know, we just, I don't know if you saw up on Monday Night Football, we, we as ESPN did this great piece on our My Cause, My Cleats uh, campaign. So uh, we, uh, I, I won't take too much time on that, but 
you know, no, go ahead. We got all the time in the world. When we see athletes, you know, um, we see athletes getting involved with this and like, wow, I didn't know that much about veterans. And this is so cool. It sticks with them. Um, I, you know, there are stories of, you know, um, of, you know, if you look at the biggest philanthropists, people putting the most money into helping veterans, almost none of them are veterans, uh, which is kind of amazing, right? Um, you think, think someone like Stephen Cohn with the Cohn Veterans Network, um, not a veteran, his son, and, and let me ask you how many, how many people of his wealth do this, who have kids who do this, his son joined the Marine Corps, became a combat yeah. Marine, came back and said, dad, a lot of my Marines are struggling with mental health and you need to do something about it. And he's, you know, one of the biggest funders of uh, veteran causes in the country now with these free mental health clinics all over the country, just as one example. So like, let's never, it's never good for a community of veterans to be insular, right? Like it, we should welcome others who want to help in. Um, they, they, they often have different experiences. They think differently and they really want to give back and, and you know, like thinking about Gary Sinise, I mean, Gary Sinise, oh, yeah. is like not a veteran, by the way, think of Tom Hanks, not a veteran, but think how much good they've done for our community. Um, so I think it's really important to pause and honor that and develop those, those relationships. You never know where they're going to go. Howard Schultz, um, he literally tells a story where he had in his, until he was in his fifties, he'd never stepped foot on a military base, even though joint base Lewis McCord was, you know, half an hour away from him in Seattle. And he got invited to speak at West Point and he spent the day before he spoke touring West Point and was so, he wrote about it in his book, was like so struck by it. He's like, how is there this huge part of our society that I knew nothing about and never experienced? Um, and, you know, that's really, really important to delve into that area and, um, you know, cultivate people like this to, to experience our community. It's a ripple effect. You know, I, I, that's one of my favorite sayings, but it really is. You really need to get out of this community. What's, what's those figures? It's like 1% have served post 9 11. It's some crazy. Yeah, I mean, you've had three, yeah. 3 million people uh, serve in combat since 9 11 or serve in yeah. combat zones since 9 11, to be precise. So, you know, th what, 330 million Americans, 1%. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so it's important. And, you know, as, as these wars wind, have wind, wound down, uh, you know, it's, it's going to fade from America's consciousness. And yeah. we have to, you know, the more broad our, our community, broadly our community is connected, the better. And that's what's one good thing about social media. One great thing about podcasting. Oh my gosh. I love having a platform like this to be able to talk about that. One thing too, is bringing civilians into the fold. Like my show used to be protectors, law enforcement, military veterans, emergency responders, but now it's end those that support them but not only that but everybody's a protector protecting their family protecting their community being involved so it's not just this alienized community of people who wear a uniform or wore a uniform or who are out there but no it's just everybody is a protector in their own way and i want I, we need to keep the community we need things like call of duty endowment we need to be able to go out there and, and talk about these things so maybe there will be a corporate donor Maybe there will be, you know, someone that says, I didn't know that. Maybe I should help out. Because you know well, as well as I do, when it comes to the fundraising aspect for, for nonprofits, is getting your voice in front of the right person and, and sharing your message in order to get the funding, in order to get vets hired. So it just it ripples across the, the sphere. Absolutely. Um, you know, we... I you know, there's, there's a real, because of the civilian military divide, there's a lack of appreciation, I think, of the skill sets veterans have. Uh, and not just the, the skill sets, the experiences, the maturity, it, it's unusual, it's different from what you find from, you know, a young woman or man who's, you know, maybe going from high school, right, to the job market or college, right, to the job market. You were touching on that earlier. Um, and let, let's take the medics issue. So, um, you know, this is crazy. We all know anybody who's worn a uniform knows what a medic, the most basic level of training every medic and corpsman gets in San Antonio is $100,000 worth of training. And in more than half the states in the country, um, they literally, when they get out, even if, they, I don't care if they've had one year or 20 years of, of experience, they can't ride in the back of an ambulance in, in more than half the states of America, where we have a, a, a crisis, a national crisis in healthcare staffing. Um, 
And we did a whole study on it. I highly recommend you checking it out. We rated every single state and territory on their, their uh, shortfalls. Uh, there are a couple of states that are really good. Uh, well, shout out to Arkansas and shout out to North Carolina. This is not a red state, blue state issue. It's an American issue. Um, there are states that are really, you know, really that you think would be really good with high, with high veteran populations like Hawaii and California, and they're terrible, absolutely terrible. California, every state has a different, or excuse me, every county, every county, 50 plus counties has a different standard for whether a medic can become an EMT. It's just nuts. And we're talking about like a very basic certification that every medic and corpsman is ready to go on. And people ask me, why is this? And I say, you know, I think people want to find like a nefarious source, like, oh, it's the unions or it's the, you know, the state's not wanting to give up tax revenue. It's not that. I don't think it's that. From our experience, it's literally this lack of understanding of the military community and what we have to offer. And by the way, that crosses over into many other fields, mechanics, truckers. Um, you know, there's just utter lack of appreciation of what it means. And we have a language problem too, right? We have, you know, we don't call a truck driver in the army a truck driver. We call them a transportation, you know, they have a transportation yes. MOS, you know, like, well, what does that mean to a civilian employer? It takes some explaining. Um, well, you know, we, until recently, the army wasn't sending um, its truck drivers out in the world with commercial driver's license. So you can ride, ride, drive a rig through the Khyber Pass, but you can't drive it on I-10. That's messed up, right? Like we, the military needs to, and the army to its credit is doing this in a number of fields, but they need to begin with the end of mind and say, look, we are producing people who have to, every, the one thing you can sell about everyone in the military, at some point, they will be a veteran. They will be going back to the civilian world we need to prepare them. Part of the DOD's mission, in my, in my view, should be producing better citizens, sending people in the community who are going to be successful, and they'll be your best recruiters. We're not doing a very good job of that. Okay, We've you just break down those barriers. You're killing me. You just, I just got this light bulb in my head, and I'm thinking to myself. So when I was Joe Snuffy back in the day, I was on a self-propelled artillery. I did the artillery piece for a while, but then I, I drove what they call a palletized load system. Huge ass truck. And I got a little piece of paper that says, okay, you could drive this. That probably, like, if I got out and I didn't go the law enforcement route or college or all that, I could have probably just driven a truck. But I didn't have a license. I didn't have a CDL. Nope. And can you imagine, you have a private, 18, 19 years old, driving millions of dollars worth of equipment around, and they can't have the basic licenses for that. Mechanics. No, for, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Mechanics. The mechanical, you know, taking apart a jet engine, taking apart an M1 Abrams, putting it back together, taking apart, putting it back together. But the medic, but the medic thing is really, you know what? I need to write an article about that. Where can we find more information about that? Yeah. So um, please check out our study. Go to callofdutyendowment.org slash medics. And you'll see there. You Check out, um, we, we not only published a slick study, but we actually have all the raw data there as well. So you can dig in and find out how your state or territory is doing uh, and what they need to do to improve. Um, I, I got to give big kudos to the governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchison. His state's one of the best. And he, he personally reached out and said, Dan, what can we do better? And he had his whole team on and we gave him a couple suggestions. And he, he immediately was like, OK, we're going to do that. And they did it. So, um, you know, there's some governors who really care because they know that some of them, one, get, not, not all of them, but they get the talent. And two, they've got a big problem, especially rural states. And, you know, they, they don't have people to drive the ambulances or certainly to ride in the back of them. They, they, they have hospitals that are going without staffing. And, you know, EMTs is a very basic level of qualification. Most of our medics and corpsmen have much higher levels of experience, so they could become nursing assistants or PAs. Um, and, you know, with a little extra work, um, Virginia's got a really cool program they've introduced where they're now letting right out of the military, they're letting medics and corpsmen apprentice in hospitals and have a much higher uh, degree of responsibility. They pass special legislation. Anyway, you can dig in and see how your state. No, I will definitely. I, cause one thing is, I, so probably about a year or two ago, you know, home, I, you know, I used to work for Homeland Security. They have a hiring crisis all the time. Um, and the, my current agency, the other particular set of skills I have is I'm, I am a lean six Sigma green belt. So I know how to lean things down. So I took their hiring process here, which was nine months, dropped it to 120. And I said, you know what? You we could hire candidates in the federal government, right from the military, in the law enforcement jobs who have their like 
for one, they have a physical fitness test, not a physical fitness test, but a, um, a physical. So where do you know that they're medically, if they're medically qualified before they get out? The other two is a clearance. If they have any type of clearance, that alleviates so much timeline. And that is one of the biggest crunches when it comes to getting people boots on the ground into law enforcement. Same thing with medics. Like you said, if you're going to bring citizens and make better citizens, and these people have the skills, don't let those skills go to waste. TAP should have another thing said, okay, you've committed to get out of the service. We're going to make sure that you have this training. And TAP should start a year out, not like two weeks before you get out and checking a block. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to, it rarely does, right? Because you know how it goes. You get road hard, put away wet, especially yeah. if you're deploying. Um, and, you know, who's in charge of that? Well, it's probably your chain of command, right? And what's their priority? The priority is, you know, arguably what should be to fight and win the nation's wars, to be ready, right? It's yes. all about readiness. And, um, you know, really hard for some, you know, company commander to say, okay, now I've got to set aside time to get my, mm. my people who are leaving ready for their transition. So our, and our, arguably, what does that person know about transition? Not a damn thing. Yeah. Um, what, what, is, what do generals and admirals know about transition? No. Not a damn thing, because most of them have been in the military since they were 18, right? Um, they don't have any special knowledge here. Um, you need people who know what they're doing. That's why we encourage everyone who's, you know, even if you've been out for years and you're not happy with the quality of your employment, reach out to one of our grantees. You can go to calldutyendowment.org and just as, as Jason very nicely laid out, um, we'll route you right to the best fit um, organization that we fund. It costs you zero. Uh, and, and these are the best organizations in the country that do the work. Okay, here we go. This is the last question. But first, before we get to the last question, I do want to say go to Call of Duty Diamond, take a pause, check it out. And if you're playing Call of Duty, uh, my gamer tag is Jazzpick, J-A-S-P-P-I-C-C. -C. I will gladly get killed by your 12-year-old son or you. Um, and I won't swear into the microphone, I promise. But anyway, check them out and also buy one of the packs. It really does help. But the, we're recording this before the Army-Navy game. And I'm going with Army 28, Navy 21. I'm so sorry that your Navy is going to lose, but it's okay, Dan. Yeah, I'm sorry you got your numbers backwards, but that's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> you, know, you might be numerically dyslexic. So I'm going with the other, the opposite of that spread. <laughs> okay, what, what, what what's your spread? What do you got? Oh, it's, it's Navy 28, Army 21 for sure. Okay, we'll go. So I will tell you, in my experience, a lot of times these games come down to a field goal. So I know it could be, be less. Uh, I can't wait. Anyway, Dan, I really appreciate you coming back on the show. Oh, hey, Jason, it's an honor. Thanks so much for having me.